Yuri Perez is out for the season. Shohei Otani hit his first homer, and we are going getting off to a flying start in AL Towers. Eric Samolski from Roto World will join me on the Roto Wire Fantasy Baseball Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome to the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast, brought to you by Vivid Seats, Rival Fantasy, and Home Run Forecast. I'm Jeff Erickson here with Eric Samolski from NBC and Roto World. Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, you know, I was looking forward to it ever since the the Tout draft. You know, we like to get yeah. a chance to talk about the teams, but um, always happy to talk about baseball, especially now that we've got uh, you know a, a week of games under our belt. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it, it's all of our assumptions are now getting challenged and all that there. Bailey sure. over just got rocked again. Yeah. I, you know, I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting for that last homer to land. Uh, that was a killer for me in AL Tout. I have them in a lot of places, actually. So uh, we'll see about that. But we'll get into Tout a little bit later. Uh, we got to start out with some negative news. Yuri Perez out for the season needing Tommy John surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I nobody likes to, like, do the – Oh, this is what I thought. But, you know, I, I think there was always that weird silence around the injury. The first time yes. it happened, there was a shoulder injury that we didn't hear anything for a week. And then they were like, or it was an elbow injury and we didn't hear anything for a week. And then they said, oh, he'll be, he'll be back in June or whatever. And then we heard nothing really about the progress. And it just seemed like something that was trending in the wrong direction. And it's unfortunate that, you know, we're going to miss – a year of pitching from a really good young pitcher. And that's kind of, you know, one of the downsides in addition to fantasy baseball is just, you know, watching Yuri Perez pitch. I, I think he was due for a good season on some improvements. I was hoping he was going to make. And now we just kind of have to wait and, and see that in 2025. Yeah, that's right. And it just, another log on the dumpster fire. That is the Marlin starts of the season here. Yeah. It's uh, been rough. Oh, really rough. I mean, it started in the off season, you know, losing uh, Alcantara, you know, to, for the season uh, with his Tommy John losing Solera in free agency, not really even trying to sign him, not signing anybody really of losing, note in free agency, losing the losing the architect of their roster and Kim Ng too. Yes, I, mean, I think you know yeah. all of that you know factors in certainly. Yeah, and I I think. That, I think she saw the writing on the wall a little bit there with the lack of investment in the current roster uh, mm -hmm. that they just, I mean, they made that, they made the trades uh, last year uh, that, you know, the Jake Berger trade in particular was a home run Worked. yeah, uh, quite a bit, but, and granted, it's a seven game start they're, You know, they're going to get some of their yes. pitchers back, but this is, this is a rough one here too, especially because they did everything possible to try to baby Yuri Perez to try to prevent mm -hmm. this. And here we are still. Yeah, I, and I think that's that will potentially be the most interesting conversation that comes from this is, mm -hmm. you know, we're seeing all these pitcher injuries and we're seeing them whether it's 200 inning workhorses or guys who are really, um, you know, monitor, you know, really carefully monitored. Um, and there's already been some interesting conversations today, um, you know, between Kyle Body on Twitter and some other, you know, guys from, you know, The Athletic who are doing stories, basically suggesting that, like, it's also about lifestyle and recovery and what these pitchers are doing between starts you know not just between pitches but between starts to make sure their body is recovering in the way that it should has a real impact on you know their their long-term health throughout a season um and so you know we'll i'm sure we'll hear some pitch clock mentions sure um, and you should we'll hear lots of stuff and you should yeah I, I i think the the reality is it's probably more than just one thing that's yes. going to go into this it's the pitch clock it's the velocity it's you know, some pitch shapes that aren't natural to pitchers. It's what they're doing between starts. It's it's a lot of things. And, you know, uh, I don't know that we're going to get the, like, if we do this, we won't have injuries anymore type of answer that we'd love to get. Right. Well, and let's face it, since baseball's had pitchers, pitcher injuries have existed. Um, you know, there's a reason it's named Tommy John for a pitcher that pitched in the 70s and 80s. Right. It's not like uh, the, the lesser velocity then prevented Tommy John surgeries, uh, elbow injuries at all. No, it's just they found a new way to try to repair it and try to re revive some careers. Um, and, you know, Gary, I'm a Reds fan. Gary Nolan would have had a different career had the you know advancements in Tommy John uh, been in, uh, developed. Then Don Gullett probably would have had a different career, too, although he had shoulder problems in addition to elbow problems. Uh, but the point is, you know, it's like, can pitchers be saved? You know, can't, you know. Yes. When they throw that hard, it's not a natural motion. Yeah, it's a, it is a, I, 
It's a tough question because I think we know deep down that the reality is this is always going to happen. Um, you know, it's, as you mentioned, it's not a natural throwing motion and it's not a natural throwing motion to do over and over and over and over again, right. um, especially at the speeds they do, but even not at the speeds, you know, as you mentioned, like even guys who are going to throw 87 to 90, it's, it's always going to be a risk. Um, and that is the sad truth. And I think you're also seeing how that is impacting the financial compensation of these pitchers in just the off season right now, you're, you're not seeing teams want to give long contracts to pitchers who are injury risks. And I really do think the next couple of years, you'll see a pretty drastic shift in the way in which pitchers are viewed and paid in, in baseball. Um, And it'll be an interesting time for all of us. Yeah. Cause it it, it is a very interesting time because there's so much emphasis on driveline or other academies trying to add velocity and all that. And it, it, I'm not even saying this is a driveline problem. It's not. Like you said, there's many other issues here involved. But, you know, the emphasis on velocity, you know, is is readily apparent. And it's not just starting pitchers. It's relief pitchers. And we see a high rate of injury with them as well. Um, but, you know, every team's got four guys that throw 95 with movement. You know, and right. that well, it's, it's just a different game now. But at some point, you know it's taking its toll there but i like I, I remember mark Pryor had perfect mechanics he was supposed to never get hurt right. and his career was ruined by arm injuries i know yeah i mean listen I, as a red sox fan the three red sox pitchers that had the biggest velocity increases in spring all three now have elbow surgery in this offseason um and you know is that a coincidence it, it's hard to suggest that it is but but potentially right. um but yeah i mean you know it's unfortunate for the league. Um, it's unfortunate for the Marlins. I think for fantasy managers in this particular instance, it probably wasn't something, it's not going to drastically change a lot of what we, we do. I think people who had Yuri Perez were expecting him to be out for a while. Now he's out longer than a while. Um, the Marlins already had spots in their rotation, so there's no immediate action that gets taken. There's potentially a little bit longer window for guys like Trevor Rogers or Max Meyer to stick in the rotation, right. even when Edward Cabrera and Braxton Garrett return. Um, you know, but in the immediate, you know, Perez wasn't coming back for another two months. So in the immediate, there's there's no actionable changes. It's just what you do for the remainder of the season. Exactly. Exactly right. Uh, and there was already an article in the Athletic today by Ken Rosenthal talking about the Marlins selling. This was before the Perez news yes. broke. Yeah. Um, and you know, in the awful start, they're zero and seven to begin the year. Uh, as we alluded to, they didn't spend in the off season. They have a new GM. Uh, so this might have this might accelerate that path. We'll see. But uh, I don't yeah. know. Man. It's, it's really tough. AJ Puck. Let's talk a little AJ Puck because sure. he was super trendy in draft season. Had a phenomenal spring. And the results of his first two starts in the majors have been awful this year. Six walks against the Pirates. Another tough outing yesterday. Uh, I, I I don't have any puck because he got expensive. I wanted puck. I had puck FOMO, you know, but yeah. uh, now what do you do if you have AJ puck right now? What do the Marlins do? So I think, I think the Marlins hold for a little bit longer, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I do think I said that I think a lefty, is going to get removed from the rotation when Braxton Garrett comes back because I don't think they're going to take away Max Meyer because then that gives them five left-handed starters. And I know that seems like a foolish bit of analysis, but I also don't think a Major League Baseball team wants to run five left-handed starters out there. It it is a disadvantage against right-handed heavy lineups. I had thought that made Ryan Weathers or Trevor Rogers the most vulnerable. It might make A.J. Puck the most vulnerable because also Tanner Scott is losing his command in the bullpen. Yes. And so AJ Puck could get moved to the bullpen. And that's also part of the reason why I don't advocate for cutting AJ Puck outright, just like because he's not pitching well right now. Um, Obviously in shallow formats, and obviously if you don't have the need for a reliever, and there's a really good streamer on, there's always situations. But I think that AJ Puck's worst case scenario might be getting moved back to the to the bullpen where he was pretty good last year, and he could maintain fantasy value in that role. Um, I also, you know, I I like said something on Twitter the other day is people are like, oh well, you know, we don't want to overrate. This is why we don't overrate spring stats. And I think it's important to understand that AJ Puck is not the product of spring training. Spring training 
increased his ADP because he looked so good. But this is a former top prospect who was really good as a, as a reliever, who was getting a chance to move into the starting rotation. That profile is always going to be intriguing because if it works, there's value in it. So I think AJ Puck was always going to be intriguing to people given just the role shift. The fact that he went out and had a really good spring took his ADP from like 280 to like 220 and caused some people to miss out on him. And that may have elevated him. You know, some people are drafting him as like their SP5, SP6. And I understand the frustration there. Right. But he wasn't just a product of, of spring. Um, you know, I, I think there are still he, – he wasn't terrible – in the start against the Angels. He had a bad first inning, and then that Vidal Brujan error was, oh. I mean, a, a ground ball like right through the through legs. Through the wickets. Oh. Um, and so there are some things like that where it's like, you're not going to defend the first start. The command was terrible. He's never really had command issues. In the Angels start, the first inning was terrible. And mm. then the bullpen, or the sorry, the defense let him down. So I think like if you're in a 15-team league or whatever, I don't know that you have to cut him. You could, you certainly could. There's arguments for it, um, but I, I I believe that if you do cut him, I think he'll be back in the waiver wire conversation at some point in the next few weeks because there is still talent there. I agree, and not only that, he could close. I mean, right? You know, Scott had command problems before. Last year was the anomaly. Last year was the right. year that he got him under control. So uh, that's certainly possible. A couple other points, uh, and then we'll move on. Puck was moved to the bullpen as a prospect because he had tr- problems with durability in the past. So right. there's a reason why he was there in the first place. Same tr- same holds true with Jordan Hicks, for that matter, too. There's a yeah. reason why Jordan Hicks was moved to the bullpen. It's because they worried about his durability. So, you know, we'll see. Yeah, that, that injury history, that injury history was a real thing. And that's why even when you were drafting Puck, you were saying, the Marlins will let him pitch as long as he can. The yes. thought was that health would get to him before, you know, command or whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't think you ever drafted AJ Puck thinking you were definitely getting 140 innings out of him. Um, you probably thought you would get at least, you know, 100 before he got some sort of injury. Um, and you you might still. Who knows how the next few starts are going to go. Indeed. Shohei Otani hit his first uh, Dodgers homer yesterday. We're going to talk about that in a second. But first, a quick note from our uh, sponsor over at Rival Fantasy. It's a new baseball season, and that means it's time for MLB DFS on Rival Fantasy. If you want to make everyday draft day, try out Rival Fantasy's daily and weekly MLB best ball. Draft a squad for a single day slate or an entire week of games. Play the matchups and home road splits without worrying about waiver pickups or daily roster management. Drafting isn't your thing. Rival Fantasy has Fantasy Bingo, a salary cap free DFS game. Fill out your squad and try to complete achievements on your bingo card. Get five in a row or four in a corner to win. Then there's challenges. Pick which player will score more fantasy points in head-to-head matchups. DFS has never been easier. Go to joinrival.com slash rotowire or use code rotowire at sign up to get a $200 deposit match plus $25 in free entries. If you're ready to play fantasy sports made for sports fans, it's time to play on Rival Fantasy. I'm here with Eric Samolski. He is with Roto World. You can check out his uh, Roto World MLB show with Scott Pianowski. Uh, and also check out Mixing It Up every Wednesday up on Roto World. In fact, his, his column this week we're going to refer to in a little bit uh, when we get to Shane Bieber. But first, Shohei Otani finally hits his first homer. Finally, nine games into uh, his Dodger career. I, I do say finally a little bit, though, because like you know, he had the Tommy John surgery like Bryce Harper last year. It's the internal bracing procedure that a lot of hitters have done lately. Uh, and when Harper came back and when other hitters have come back from similar procedures, power has often been slow to come by this first couple months back. So that's something I've been watching with Otani going forward. But <laughs> that shot yesterday, there's no power outage on that one. 430 right. to right center. Yeah, I think that, you know, who knows with like a Bryce Harper situation, you know, when they have those surgeries, if the power is fully gone or you're just not mm-hmm. able to get to it as consistently as possible. I don't think anybody right. expected Otani would have no power, but I think it's important to to expect a slow buildup of that power again. Um, and so, you know, I look at I was I'm looking I'm, I've been trying to look at like anything in the profile that suggests you know, a difference. I know his walk rate is down a little bit, but like there's nothing in his swing decisions that suggests any sort of change. He's not being more passive. He's actually chasing outside of the zone less than Mm -hmm. he did historically. 
So nothing in here suggests that like there's any, oh, he's, you know, that whole like I'm pressing in the first year of a new team and a big contract. Like I just think, you know, Bryce Harper didn't have a hit until he had three home runs in one game. And this is kind of a little bit right. of what we see in, in the beginning of the season. You know, I, I think Otani's power will be there. I think we should never have expected him to hit 40 home runs in a year coming off of that kind of major arm surgery. But, you know, I think he'll get to 30, 30 plus by the end of the year. Yeah. And and not only does the, that, but also he's going from Anaheim, which has that low line in right center, you know, and right uh, to Dodger stadium, which isn't necessarily a Homer friendly ballpark too. So that, that might be worth two homers right there also to kind of mm-hmm. cut off of his projection. Um, I don't have any Otani this year. I just, I didn't like all the confluence of the elbow lining up the locking up the UT spot, maybe changing locations, uh, late in drafts, the, the gambling story. We'll see. I think that knocked me down a little bit. on right. him. That could be to my chagrin. I mean, I love him. I want to, wa- I want to root for him. It's not, I, I don't have anything against Otani, but I don't have him in any of my 14 managed Roto leagues. Yeah, I, I don't either because I expected more of the 2022 Otani season mm-hmm. than the 2023. I thought, especially coming off of the surgery, I thought, again, we'd see something in the mid thirties home runs. I thought the batting average might come down just a little bit. He hit 273 and 222. And I expected something closer to like 10 to 15 steals rather than 20 because the majority of the time you're stealing, you're sliding into second head first. Right. Um, and so, again, coming off that arm injury, I just didn't know how often the Dodgers wanted to send him. Um, and especially hitting in the lineup that he's hitting in, like if he was going to hit second, like why wouldn't you let the guys behind him hit? So – for me, that that was enough to push me off of him where he was going, where like I would have taken him if he came back around like at the beginning of the second round or something like that. It just never really got there in any of the drafts I was in. Right. Looking at the Dodgers as a whole, they're already managing their starting pitching staff. Tyler Glasnow's made three starts. Nobody mm-hmm. else has made more than two. Uh, Yamamoto made two, and one of them was only one inning. Uh, we've seen only one start from Bobby Miller and Gavin Stone and James Paxton. And we saw one like bullpen game basically uh, where Brazier opened and then Yarbrough got the bulk innings. Mm-hmm. But point is, it's like they're already managing even before we get like Walker Bueller into the mix. It's kind of interesting to see how they're kind of parceling out the innings so far. Yeah. And honestly, that was why I, I think Ryan Yarbrough was a great pick in a lot of deep leagues because you mm-hmm. knew that the Dodgers were going to do that with their starting pitching. And so, you know, Yarbrough is going to get bulk relief appearances um it's almost better when he isn't like the pseudo starter when like he only needs to go three innings but yeah i still think in deeper formats like yarbrough is going to steal a lot of wins this year i would not be surprised if he has like eight or nine wins by the end of the year yeah. we'll always have that peak year with the rays where he had like yes. 16 wins that was crazy uh, how, mm-hmm. how well that worked out there and it probably led him to be overdrafted for the next three years after that there. sure but now he's in that proper situation again there um i i have some serious bobby miller fomo though that's the oh, one i regret he's so good yeah, he's yeah. so good. Look, we're we're a week into the season, and the Dodgers have a Ryan Yarbrough win and a Denelson Lamette save, and yep, that's just what the Dodgers, what the and Dodgers, a Daniel do. Hudson win and a save. Yes, right. absolutely. And now yeah. we're probably going to get some Taylor Trammell in the outfield. Um, so who knows? And they'll still finish with the best record in baseball. Yeah, because that chorus is still ridiculous. Mookie is ridiculous yes. as always. Freddie Freeman will never miss any time at all, ever. Um, yeah, it, it's nice. Uh, it's nice to have that at the top there. It, it really is. I mean, it's, you know, if you're a rival of them, it sucks that uh, not only are they rich, but they're smart too. And then they develop yeah. prospects so well. Um, and that's one of the things that, that feeds the machine. You get a Will Smith. You get uh, Bobby Miller in, in their system. They're not getting top five overall picks, and they're cranking these guys out. Right. Yeah, I mean that like there's a reason they've been successful for so long. There's just good organizational decisions and you know mm-hmm. you it's not you don't want to see them slip up a little bit, but sometimes you want to see them slip up a little bit and just kind of uh let right. some other people have some fun, you know. Exactly. Exactly right. Uh we're going to talk a little Michael Garcia and his newfound power, but first Baseball is finally back. This MLB season knocked out of the park with vivid seats and scored great tickets to the biggest games of the year. Every fastball, every home run, and every eye-popping play of your favorite team live and in person. Plus, with vivid seats and rewards, you earn rewards with every single purchase. Just buy 10 tickets, then cash in with your credit towards your free 11th ticket. Talk about an easy win. And here's a pro reward tip. When buying tickets for your whole group, split the bill and make progress towards your free 11th ticket even faster. 
From behind the dugout to the upper deck, Vivid Seats has great tickets for all the 2024 games that matter to you. Just visit VividSeats.com or download the app today. Vivid Seats. Experience it live. See VividSeats.com slash rewards for terms and conditions. Also, we're on the Blue Wire Network. Here are their ads. Thank you to Blue Wire for hosting us. As always, I'm here with Eric Samolski. You can fo follow him on Twitter at S-A-M-S-K-I-N-Y-C, Samsky NYC on Twitter. See all of his work uh, there, and you can figure, you know, find out when his articles, his podcasts are up. Make sure to check that out. Eric, you tweeted about Michael Garcia. He hit his third home run yesterday. He's hitting rockets left and right. Yeah, I, people should um, should know. I, I know who Michael Garcia is. Um, I just started a little joke a couple weeks ago when, you know, people were all trying to claim him as their sleeper. And so I pretended that he was a sleeper and yeah. you probably didn't know about him. And now people think I don't know who he is. Um, but yeah, listen, Michael Garcia uh, looks great. He was, you know, as Paul Spore refers to, like a wide awake sleeper. Um, it seemed like everybody w was in on him based on, you know, his barrel rates last year, sorry, his hard hit rates last year and the thought of just like, what if he lifted a little more? What if he pulled a little more? He was going to lead off, right? And there was a, a delay in some of the sites. Um, as much as I love roster resource and I use it a lot, there was a delay in them putting him in the leadoff spot, even though right. it seemed like he was going to lead off. And I think that kept his draft price down a little bit. Um, and yeah, look, we're dealing with super small sample sizes right now. We understand that, you know, it's only been six games for the Royals. Um, so he will not have a 31.6% barrel rate on the year. I, I promise you, but you know, he has a 47% fly ball rate right now. It was 27% last year. Um, who knows where that settles, but that clearly shows us a guy trying to put the ball in the air a little bit more than he was previously. He's pulling the ball 10% more than he did last year. Who knows where that settles? But to me, in the early going of the season, that suggests a hitter who is trying to get to his pull power a little bit more. Maybe he's able to do that hitting second or hitting first in front of Bobby Witt Jr. And he's getting more hittable pitches because Michael Garcia can run. Maybe right. they don't want to put him on base and let him get into scoring position ahead of the middle of the order. So maybe he's seeing a little bit better pitches. This is stuff we don't have all of the data early on, but we can understand a player who had a talent level who is right. trying to reach another level that the skills suggest he had. Um, and so to a certain extent, I, I buy this fully. I think a 2020 season was always within the cards, and I feel really good about a 2020 season now, and we'll see if he pushes, he pushes that a little further. Great thing, too, about Michael Garcia is in a lot of leagues, you get him at both third and short. And that's kind of an interesting yep. combo, which also means you get corner and middle. Uh, at third base, we've already lost Josh Young. We've already lost Rice Lewis. It's tough out on the streets if you're trying to add a yep. third baseman on the waiver wire. Uh, so I, I think you're kind of almost using him at third, more, most likely. Right. Yeah, and my I, I have a lot of shares of Michael Garcia, and I have Michael Garcia FOMO. Because yeah. when I went into drafts in the second half of March, I was the I, I thought I felt very comfortable with either Key Brian Hayes or Michael Garcia as my third baseman. I believed in the changes they were making. I felt like I could wait at third base and get one of those guys. And I've come out of some drafts, and I was like, "Well, why didn't I just take the other one as a corner infielder?" Right. Um, and I know historically speaking, you know, especially right now, we want to get a lot of power, so we want to make sure our corner infielder is like a a, a real right. kind of surefire home run guy but i do wish that i had just gone garcia and hayes in some drafts and and had both and you know figured out the power at some other spots because um he looks really good he's doing everything we we thought that he was gonna do um and for me like you know i had garcia as a reserve pick in in tout wars last year and it's a hat tip to rob silver and james anderson who talked about him before last season and really kind of put him on the radar for me. Um, and, you know, we've been seeing this kind of slow, steady progression of his talent since then. Yeah, we're talking about Michael Garcia there for those who are just joining the conversation. We're going to move on to Shane Bieber. Subject of your mixing it up column this week on Roto World, uh, Shane Bieber, two awesome starts. You even wrote this before his second great start. I did. Yeah. The Mariners, uh, you know, he, he was great in his first start. And you're like, yeah, whatever. It's Oakland. But. All this talk about earlier about Yuri Perez, we're talking about driveline and velocity. Well, 
This is why we, we care about velocity. Shane Bieber added velocity. He's changing his pitch mix a little bit there. Uh, he's had two phenomenal starts so far. Yeah, he really has. Um, and just, you know, as you obviously mentioned, so mixing it up is this column I'll put out every Wednesday um, over on NBC Sports on Roto World where I look at um, pitchers who are making pitch mix changes and just what that means for us in fantasy, whether it's helpful um, or not. So Bieber had multiple things that I wrote about. In addition to the velocity, mm -hmm. it was um, a revamped cutter and also a revamped um, changeup and curveball. It was a lot of arsenal changes. Uh, what I found interesting is, you know, maybe this is a little bit of the cold weather at the start of the year. You know, Seattle is not the warmest um, right. place. Uh, Bieber's velocity in that last start was only 91.6 miles an hour, which is basically what he was throwing last year. Yeah. Um, and so he didn't even need the velo he didn't really even need the velocity in that last start because what we've seen is um, his tweaks to the cutter um, have made the cutter a little bit more uh, you know impactful. I really liked the cutter beforehand, um, but uh, I think that the the what he did with the cutter now is he's throwing it a little bit harder with a little bit less horizontal movement, um, and it's graded out much better on you know PLV and stuff plus and all of that. Um, it attacks lefties really well, which is nice. And then he added in a power changeup. And what the Cleveland broadcast team mentioned um, in the first start was that when his velocity was down last year, he felt like he, the changeup wasn't useful for him. Right. Because there wasn't enough velocity gap. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. So he only threw the changeup 3% of the time last year. So him having more fastball velocity allowed him to add back in a pitch that he had stopped throwing because he had more of a velocity gap. And so that changeup is another really nice pitch for lefties. Um, you know, he was throwing that changeup 89 miles an hour. So again, you're throwing a 91 mile an hour fastball, 92 mile an hour fastball, 89 mile an hour power changeup. It looked really good to me. And then he mentioned specifically, like Eno Saris talked about it a lot, that he didn't even realize he had changed his grip on his curveball. That he, the reason his curveball had kind of faltered the last couple of years was because he was subconsciously throwing it differently. And so he made a conscious effort this offseason to kind of like rediscover his curveball again. Right. So you got added velocity and essentially tweaks to three different pitches in his arsenal. Um, and he looks great. And I don't know that you're getting like, you know, early like ace Shane Bieber where he was like racking up huge strikeout totals um, and was like a top 10 pitcher in baseball. But I think you're getting a, at least a rock solid SP2 for fantasy purposes. And if the strikeout upside isn't what it used to be, I think it's still going to be really strong. And he's never really had a is an issue with ratios. And so I think you're going to be really happy if you took him in drafts. Yeah. And the question is, does he sustain over the course of a season? That That's the, and then it's the next question. Right. You know, can you do that there? Uh, but that's true with any pitcher. Every pitcher is a risk at dropping yes. off over the course of the season, too. So, uh, you know, I, you know, don't want to read too much into that. But, yeah, I, I, I like everything that I've seen there. Meanwhile, his teammate uh, Shane, uh, Tanner Bybee pitches today, and I have a lot of Bybee in my life. Uh, unfortunately, he looked horrible against Oakland yeah. uh, in his first I, start. Pitches today against I, Minnesota. I was a little bit – I was off Bybee in the sense that – People saw his stat line last year, and I think like you know I was on. We did Potapalooza before TGFBI, and you yep. know one of the questions was is Tanner Bybee an AL Cy Young candidate? And I was like, I think we need to pump the brakes, right? Mm -hmm. I know he had a great first year. You know, if you believe in Sierra and XFIP and stuff like that, all of that suggested that he was pitching a little bit. You know, uh, over, he was out over his skis a little bit. He threw a lot of breaking balls up in the zone last year, and I know they didn't get hit, but to me that worries me. I, you don't generally don't want breaking balls up in the zone, um, and so I was hoping for a, like an approach change from him. I don't think he'll be as bad as we saw in the in the first start, but I, I think that there'll be more inconsistencies. Um, and on your point about Shane Bieber and just whether he can keep it through the whole season, I think that sometimes we, because it's not there's no data we can put to it we don't like take into account things like this is a contract year for right. a pitcher who's probably getting his last big contract. Right. Right. Like if, if Bieber signs a two, three year deal in the off season, it's probably the last big money contract he'll sign 
as he continues to get older, you might see like a one-year deal here or whatever. And I think he wants to earn that contract. He wants to go out and make sure that he sets himself up for a good year. And so that's why you see driveline. And that's why you see those off the renewed offseason dedication for a pitcher who like who maybe, you know, just was worried about arm care and being healthy and getting out on the field. And, you know, he added he added pitches to make up for his lack of velocity in previous years, but he wasn't trying to add back velocity. And now you're seeing all of it together because right. there's li- there's livelihood on the line. And, and that is a really powerful motivator for people, understandably so. Absolutely. Absolutely. It doesn't work yet for everyone under the contract year theory, but sure. it is a great yeah. motivator for sure. hundred percent. And especially, you know, you have to question whether the payoff is going to be there after we witnessed the, uh, the Boris nuclear winner here. But yeah, uh, right. then again, that might be just a Boris thing too. Um, and the way he was trying to hold the line negotiation wise too. Yeah. You'd like to think that Cleveland would at least be willing to pay him Right. more than a fair share if he wanted to come back because he has been their guy for so long. Um, for sure. And if he has, if he has a good year here, he's, he's earned it. Yeah. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, all right. One more piece of business before uh, that we got to take care of here from our friends at home run forecast. Can certain weather conditions lead to more home runs? The atmosphere can affect how far a baseball flies by 20%. Home run forecast measures the weather conditions at a ballpark to tell us that the atmosphere is good or bad for ball flight during a game. An index value that rates the air is created for each game and ballpark and is displayed on a scale from 1 to 10. Home Run Forecast Premium site offers index values by the hour for each game, 24-hour forecasts, wind direction and speed, and even whether the roof will be open at certain stadiums. Home Run Forecast is offering a special for the start of the baseball season. You can get access to the premium site for the entire season for only $28, a savings of nearly 30%. Go to homerunforecast.com slash rotowire now to sign up. I'm here with Eric Samolski. We're going to talk Tower Wars in a second, but got uh, one more other, one other topic I wanted to hit up here, and that's the Boston uh, Red Sox starting rotation. Uh, across the board, they've, they've looked really darn what, good. Now, granted, at, at at Seattle, at Oakland again. Here we go with that combination. Cleveland right. pitchers, Boston pitchers both getting that fresh, uh, really nice start, but I've got Cutter Crawford in a number of places. Obviously, Nick Cavetta has been a guy that's been uh, very popular in, in certain circles. Brian Bayo might not have benefited as much, but I still think he's another guy that's interesting. And even Tanner mm-hmm. Houck looked really good the other day. Yeah, I mean, that easy schedule. I mean, they get the Angels this weekend. Then yes. they get the Orioles. But then they get the Angels again. Um, so you're, you're going to get a few good matchups still coming from Boston. Um I also wrote about this because I wrote about Garrett Whitlock in my Mixing It Up column, and I mentioned the organizational pitching philosophy changes in Boston. I think it's really important. Like Boston overhauled their pitching development in the offseason. Yes. Craig Craig Breslow, who was brought in to be the director of baseball operations, is a former pitcher, Um, and he was responsible for a lot of the pitching growth in Chicago, or at least people have given him credit for that. Right. Andrew Bailey was brought in as the pitching coach. He's, you know, been a, tr- a lot of success with the Giants has been attributed to Andrew Bailey. Justin Willard was poached from the Twins, who we know have done really good things with like Joe Ryan and Pablo Lopez in recent years. And he was the director of pitching. They hired Kyle Body, who founded Driveline, to be a consultant for them. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we think like, oh, okay, who's the prospect that's going to pop the most, right? Who's going to improve the most with this pitching tutelage? And what's going to happen in a year or two? And what we're seeing is sometimes the changes are immediate in them just saying, hey, our philosophy is different. The Red Sox are not throwing four-seam fastballs. They're, they threw four-seam fastballs, the lowest of any team in baseball over the first week. They actually have a historically low percentage of four-seam fastballs used nice. if they were to continue this rate. Um, the Athletic, I encourage everybody to check out The Athletic's article, which has an interview. Uh, I believe Jen McCaffrey wrote it, has an interview with Red Sox pitching coach Andrew Bailey, and he referred to the four-seam fastball as a jab. And he said, you want to use the jab to set up your knockout pitches, and the knockout pitches are the swing and miss pitches, the off-speed pitches, et cetera. But you don't want to rely on the jab over and over again. You need to make sure you're using it situationally. And I think that's why you're seeing the fastball used in in a lower such a lower percentage is that sometimes they're even using that as a strikeout pitch. They're not using it as a strike pitch anymore. They're saying, hey, I'll get ahead with a slider. I'll get ahead with a cutter because mm-hmm. I like 
pitch. I can throw it for a strike. It doesn't give up a lot of hard contact. And then if I want to use the fastball up in the zone to get an out, then I'll, I'll use it in that way. Um, and Andrew Bailey talked about like the contact rates and the damage rates on fastballs are higher than they are on almost every other pitch. Right. So if you look at a pitch that hitters do more damage on, why do I want to throw that pitch more than I, than any other pitch? Um, and so he, his belief is that this is just a response to years of data in that using the four seam less sets up the pitcher for more success. Um, and you know, again, one time through the order, but we've seen that so far and all of these guys have deep arsenals. I think I lost your audio there. I don't know if it's on. Not my microphone. Oh, um, I was talking so animatedly yes. that I hit my <laughs> microphone and it unplugged. Um, That's all right. But no, I was just saying, you know, these guys have deep arsenals of pitches right? that they don't have to rely on the fastball. And what I wrote about Garrett Whitlock was like he added two different versions of a slider to now have a cutter, a gyro slider, and a sweeper to go along with a sinker and a changeup. And this is what you're kind of seeing from the Boston rotation is right. like we're going to throw more pitches and we're not going to rely on our fastballs as much. And, you know, we'll see how it lasts throughout, but it's certainly interesting – to look at, to watch that story unfold. Absolutely. We opened the show with uh, the Yuri Perez news, needing that he's going to need Tommy John surgery. And the follow-up question actually is, you know, with this moving away from four seamers, throwing more breaking pitches, is there a greater or lesser risk of injury? I think the old saw was always, you throw more sliders, you throw more curveballs, you're going to hurt your arm more. But I don't know if that's necessarily true. Yeah. I, I think also now that we throw different types of sliders, right? Like, yeah. And also the Red Sox in particular – I've been leaning a lot on cutters this year and, you know, a cutter is a pitch that obviously has horizontal movement, but it doesn't require as much of a strain on your elbow as a slider. Cause you tend to throw it more like you would a, a fastball. Mm -hmm. And so there are some things like that where like, you know, maybe you're not, maybe you're not straining the arm as much. And also, you know, cutters tend to be pitches that when they're executed properly induce lots of ground balls and soft contact. And so maybe, if you pitch backwards in this way that the Red Sox are talking about, you don't have to throw a hundred pitches over six innings. You right. know, you can throw 87 because you're not so worried about like, am I going to rack up strikeouts? You're just trying not to get hit hard. Yeah. And if you're inducing soft contact uh, or getting called strikes, then, you know, you are, you're not putting as much strain on your arm potentially given your pitch mix and you're not having to, you know, use as many quote unquote bullets Right. And that also saves your arm. Yeah. Baseball is such a, a game of measure and countermeasures, cat and mouse yeah. there. So now we'll see all the advanced scouting on the Red Sox and the teams will try to find a way to attack that. And so we'll see the adjustments to that there and we'll mm -hmm. see if it continues to work. But it's so fun to kind of see the different approach and seeing it working so far. Now we'll see what teams do to try to tackle that. Yeah. It's, I mean, I, I do love that that chess game, that cat and mouse game. It's one of the best things to see unfold over you know a full 162 game season. Exactly. Exactly right. All right. You and I are together in Tout Wars. Um, and, you know, you actually did two drafts that weekend because you uh, helped out. Uh, <laughs> did the you were uh, you're you're proxying in the head to head auction as well uh, for. Uh, and I think that was for Greg Jewett. For if Gre I recall. Right. Who, who asked me and I didn't know that he had won last year when he asked yeah. me to draft for him. So it was a lot of, it was a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely there. But, uh, you know, it's uh it's been a fun league. Uh, I, what I noticed for you is like you were really good at like kind of saving your money at a certain point so you could try to control the end game. I know not it, it's a it's it's an art, not a science, and knowing when to jump back in so you don't get left with a lot of money on the table. Like our friend Patrick Davitt actually left a little bit too much money on the table. Yeah. Um, is that your normal style of auction? Is do you have a particular style of auction? I I actually came into this one wanting to be more aggressive early on. Um, I felt like my strength was in identifying starting pitching. Okay. And so I thought I would spend up more aggressively early on and save money and get like a bunch of start. I'd get one ace starting pitcher. And for me, it was, it was Tarek Skubal. And then okay. I would get a lot of pitchers for around $5 okay. and, you know, I would get some relievers and I would spend up more. Um, and it turned out that possibly as a, 
response to Doug Dennis and what he's been doing. Right. Um, a lot more people were spending up on hitting and not spending a lot on pitching. So the pitching values were way lower than I expected. So I was looking at hitters early on and they were, there were a bunch of hitters that were like, you know, maybe two, three dollars over, you know, where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, well I'll, I'll get, you know, people are going to eventually start spending on pitching and then I'll be able to get some of these hitters left. Um, and I, in particular, like at shortstop, I looked up at the end of the draft and I was like, oh man, yeah. all of the, all of the guys, like I had a tier that was like Jeremy Pena, Trevor Story. Um, and I forget there was like a, th I think it was, maybe it was Zach Neto. And yep. I was like, all right, these are the guys where if I don't get my top end guys, I'll get one of these for, a, um, a fine, but not, you know, too steep price. Right. And now they, they all went for like two or three more dollars than I wanted to spend on them. And I just wish I had spent it. Unfortunately, uh, or potentially fortunately for me, I wound up with Ezekiel Duran as my shortstop. Um, and yeah, the Josh Young out. injury yeah. has created a little bit more playing time for him. Um, so that may suit me in, in the long run. Um, but I definitely, I definitely was weaker in my middle infield than I wanted to be you know, coming out of the draft. Yeah. I mean, well, that's actually my weak spot too. And I made a point of spending on, uh, on hitting more. I went 200 and uh, 260, maybe even 202 and 58 respectively hitting mm -hmm. versus pitching. And yet I still found like, okay, I'm a little weak at second base. Uh, you know, I couldn't get that one last spot. Now, part of that is because I had a vanity ad. I had the extra outfielder. I, you know, I had like, I spent $7 on a Matt Walner as my fifth outfielder when we're only required to have four and you can have, yeah. you know, a UT and two swingmen, but, uh, at the same time, like I, I like Matt Walner. I want that to work out. Right. You have to scroll all the way to the right, by the way, to look at my roster because I finished dead last last year, guys. Um, it was mistakes were made. Uh, we'll just say that. And I just I knew I didn't have enough hitting last year, and it was like worst case scenario too as it worked out. So my whole goal in this draft was to get enough hitting. I feel like mm -hmm. I did. We'll see about the pitching side of things. I was like, yeah, my first pitcher rostered Cutter Crawford. Okay, that's working out all right. Yeah, look too closely because I have a fifteen dollar Bailey over as my most expensive pitcher, and that did not work out all right so far. We'll see, but I actually think I'm a. I think over is going to be okay, but uh, you know it's, it's scary to see him blow up in his first outing. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not overly worried. It's a situation where, like, again, he's been a really great command pitcher for most of his career, and his command was not great in that first start, and so I look at that as. Kind of as fluky. I like what you did with with your pitching. Um, you know, I feel like Gavin Williams is going to be back soon. Um, yeah. But Cutter Crawford, Michael Waka, Bailey Ober, Tyler Wells, like these are just solid um, starters, in particular in an AO only format. And I kind of wish I like I look back at the draft and I thought early on I was getting what I thought were values in like a guy like Dean Kremer for $5, yeah. Louis Varlin for $5, because I felt like these were guys who had made, Kremer in particular made interesting second half changes, was going to be on the, you know, the Orioles, good chance for wins. Um, and then I look up at the end of the draft and I see the pitchers that went for one. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, if I had just waited and seen which, you know, which of these guys lasted till the end and right. I could get for a dollar, like I, I liked Garrett Crochet and I had him on my list. He went for three dollars. Yeah. I'd obviously much rather have a three dollar Garrett Crochet than a five dollar Dean Kremer. Um, had I waited, I might have been able to even like throw one extra dollar than Podhorzer did. So I, I think I, in hindsight, I thought I was getting value when I was taking these guys earlier in the draft. But those final spots that I have marked for value, I'm just gonna start waiting until the end and right. not trying to like secure top end value early and just see what falls because um, I would have had more money to secure one or two more hitters. And I, I would feel a little bit more better about, about my team. Also Absolutely. spending dollars on Matt Manning and then having him later not make the rotation was not a, was not a great feeling, but he's in my reserve. And I think he's going to be really good when he gets a chance this year. It's just, you know, right. I, I have Matt Manning and Shane Boz, who will eventually be up and I think give my rotation even more stability. I just have to wait for that to happen. 
Yeah. And meanwhile, I'm waiting out uh, Jackson Holiday, you know, and I knew it was yeah. a risk that he gets sent down. And that's why he only cost 12 instead of like 17. So I'll be better in the middle infield when he ultimately gets the call. And I do think it'll be earlier rather than later. Uh, although and the Orioles, I mean, it's just like Jordan Westbrook's a good player. You know, it, it's not like, uh, you know, they got to get rid of Jordan Westbrook. Now, I, I think Ramon Urias is the guy that ultimately gets replaced. So I think I'm still OK there. But, man, it's yeah. a little frustrating. Yes, and I added Ramon Urias um, yeah. just for the time being because I, I sure. drafted Michael Massey to be my second baseman. He started the year on the IL, which, again, he was not hurt when we did this draft. Right. Um, and so I thought, okay, Ramon Urias, he's going to get near everyday playing time in a great lineup. He currently has no hits. Uh, but, you know, mm-hmm. hopefully hopefully it's not that long. Right. Um, and I, I just added uh, last week. I added Joey Votto, so we'll see. Um, and I'm going to stash him in my reserve for a little bit, and uh, we'll see if you know. I think he's going to come up and take that uh, that Vogelbach spot on the in the roster. And the the Blue Jays don't look great right now. Maybe he gets a chance. Who knows? You mentioned that you feel pretty good about identifying starting pitching talent. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you like tailor your draft strategy then to try to maybe spend more on known commodities at hitter instead of trying to dig in the corners for them? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, I, I feel I spend up even in, uh, you know, spend if you want to take like a snake draft format just in like early picks. But I like to get one locked in ace pitcher and then I'm happy to wait. And okay. I, I get. I get hitters I feel really good about. I try to get a closer or two that I feel good about so that I don't have to like dig in the muck and try to outbid people for the Jason Foley's and Kevin Ginkles of the world, you know, one week into the season. Foley is another one who bothers me because I was going to bid on him and I thought, oh, maybe I'll sneak him through in the reserves. And I filled my roster and then he was one of the final picks in the draft. And now that obviously looks like a huge um, bargain for. Um, I forget who got him. It might have actually been Duck. Uh, yeah, um, uh, no, it, was, it was Larry, Larry. Checker for a buck. They yeah. got Jason Foley. Larry's, uh, I hate it. When um, Larry gets a, Larry's too good and, to be able to get a one dollar Jason Foley. <laughs> uh, Jason Foley and and John Schreiber were two that I was gonna uh, try to sneak through in reserves. Mm-hmm. And I think that's another thing of like, you know, I know how smart everybody is in these drafts. And I still let myself believe that I can like sneak things past people. You can never sneak things no. past people. You've got to no. just say, if you really want to do something, you got to do it. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I'm happy with, you know, I got Shelby Miller and Josh Spores in reserve. I think they will be good relievers in AL only leagues. And I think they might even wind up sneaking some saves as well, but their consolation prizes for my, you know, risk risk taking and assuming I could try to like sneak something past people. And yeah, um, so that that'll be a lesson learned for me. For sure. Uh, one other thing uh, you mentioned, Doug Dennis, the impact that he has on this league. Doug has won the last two years. He's from baseball mm-hmm. HQ uh, and finished second three years ago. And in every instance, we don't have an innings floor in this league. So this is kind of unique uh, because you don't have to get to 900 innings. So Doug doesn't buy starting pitching. He, he doesn't worry about wins or strikeouts. He tries to make sure he gets, he, he's competitive in the ratios and saves and tries to just bully us with the hitting and right. it's worked. So what I've noticed is, and I think, and you mentioned it too, that you know, it's getting more and more expensive to roster hitters at every spot. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, I came into the draft with a strategy that I wanted to pay up, like really go like 30 or higher for two or three hitters. And then had a bunch of hitters where I was like, okay, if I if I go in the ten to twelve dollar range, I can still get good hitters, and that mm-hmm. would have worked last year. Right. Um, and this year, those hitters in the ten to twelve dollar range were in the fifteen to eighteen dollar range, and I was too quick to adjust to that in the draft at the time. I felt like there would be other hitters who would be available in that range. Um, and they were all gone. So like even a right. guy like, you know, one of my backup shortstop, op- shortstop options were uh, JP Crawford and Jose Caballero. And I was like, okay, these are guys who even in the AL league, they're not going to be highly bid on because they're not, they're solid. Even Caballero isn't actually solid. We don't know if he's solid. We haven't really seen it, but we know he can run. And they both went for 15. Right, um, right. And it, it turns out in hindsight, 
that's probably fair price for them given the rest of the of the draft. But at the at the time, it just seemed like oh, that's going to be too that's going to be too high. Right. Um, and then you know I wound up with like you know a three dollar Giovanni Urshela as my third baseman and a you know five dollar Ezekiel Duran and I you know I wish I had spent up on those other guys. Yeah, exactly right. Um, and that that happens even in normal onlys like that. The the inflation of these just these players that uh, just get regular playing time have one one yeah. skill. I mean that happens. JP Crawford for fifteen that happens. Uh, yeah. but it, it's still frustrating to deal with when you're, when you've got seven to spend on a spot and you think, Oh, I might be able to get a $7 middle infield. No, no, you won't. Yeah. No, you can't. That. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I mean, listen, it, I, I appreciated leaving the draft and knowing, okay, middle infield and speed. If something come and I like that those tend to like overlap in a Venn diagram, right? Middle infielders tend to run. So if somebody hits the wire, if somebody comes up who is a middle infielder who can run, then it's don't be precious with your fab, right? You know what your need is coming out of the draft. It's the one thing that I felt I missed on. And so I'll attack it if I get an opportunity to attack it. Um, And so I feel better about that than if I just felt like I went light on hitting overall, which I felt, which I felt a little bit last year. Um, and then I spent up on pitching last year, but it was like for Robbie Ray and Shane McClanahan and guys mm-hmm. who that I wound up losing and the team just like cratered in the second half of the year. I was patting myself on that, my back for the Jeffrey Spring, Springs, Drew Rasmussen combo there. Yeah. Oh, that, those were three great starts though. I really loved them. Um, <laughs> all right. Question from uh fantasy sports asking, uh, okay. If you consider uh, Shane Bieber a sell high, Who's a return bat, especially a middle infielder that you can target if if Bieber is considered a, a, that? That's so interesting. So I so I'll just put it out there. I would not. I personally would not consider Shane Bieber a sell high. Okay. Um, I would be trying to. I would be trying to hold on to him. However, um, if you did want to get rid of Shane Bieber, um, I think you are looking at a top. 25 starting pitcher Mm -hmm. and i think that has a lot of value so i I wouldn't be selling for like a part-time middle infielder i wouldn't be selling for a guy who like contributes in one category um i would be you know looking at like in the top 25 starting pitchers you were getting you know your Cattell Martes of the world. Like that's kind of where they were going in drafts. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm laughing crazy. because that was suggested in the chat too. Was it? Yeah. Yes. I mean, that, that's the, that's the range that I feel like is probably where you want to be shopping. Like I wouldn't yeah. say, Oh, Bryce Terang is off to a really good start. I will, I'll pivot and, you know, trade Bieber, you know, no. um, right. I know like Nolan Gorman is off to a slow start. Like I think, even if Gorman was off to a fine start, that's selling low on, on Bieber. Um, I'd probably even be shooting higher than like the Tyro Estrada range, but I think that's getting closer because that's like full-time playing time on a good team. Yep. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, who, like that could tell Marte range was also, I mean, Jorge Polanco is off to a, a terrible start right now. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I'm even like that's and that says something about the middle infield spots, right? right? Is like who are you even Volpe is interesting to me, maybe. I love um Volpe. I think that the batting average, um, you know, it's not gonna hit 400, but I think the swing change is is real. And I know he doesn't have a steal so far this year, but I'm we I mean he's going to, we know he's going to. Yep. Um I think that that could be an interesting swap if you were looking for for something like that. I think even like, I mean, I don't know that you could get O'Neill Cruz for Bieber. Um, I feel like people are probably too high on Bieber, but like I might try it because Bieber's looked really good in the first two starts. And O'Neill Cruz, they played so many lefties, he was hitting just seventh in the lineup. So maybe somebody is like overreacting to that. A little bit. Um, yeah. The tough part with O'Neill Cruz is whoever has O'Neill Cruz was targeting him. 
Right. You know, they, they were they were like, yes, I got O'Neill Cruz. He's awesome. Yeah. And they they and if the the later we drafted, you got him at a at a at a uh, elevated price too, for that right. matter. So it's it's even more difficult to try to be able to pull that one off. But I mean, I like it. You're right though. There's not much of a middle class uh, right. when it comes to po- uh, yeah. possibly a uh, like Nico Horner's off to a terrible start, um, and he's hitting. Um, he's not hitting leadoff. He's hitting like seventh in the lineup right. for the Cubs. Um, if you really needed speed, that could be an interesting swap because I don't think moving to seventh in the order is going to impact his ability to run. If anything, not being on base when the middle of the lineup is up will make the Cubs want him to run even more. Mm-hmm. Um, he just needs to get on base. Um, and that's a guy, you know, Nico Horner was going around like the Matt McClain, Glaber Torres, like right. around pick like 60 in drafts, even higher in some drafts, like 50. Um, and so that might be an interesting swap if you were inclined to sell high on Bieber for somebody who's trying to sell low on Nico Horner. Um, but again, I just want to put it out there that I would be holding on to Bieber myself personally. Right. Uh, well, I, I, and I agree with your conclusion. I'm sold too. Um, all right, we're going to wrap it up at that. I know you're on to your next project for the day. Um, so, yeah. uh, Eric, thank you so much for joining me for an hour. I really appreciate it there. And uh, good luck this season. I uh, like seeing all your work out there. Great stuff. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Eric Smelski, check out uh, both uh, the Roto World MLB show that he does with Scott Pianowski, as well as mixing it up every Wednesday on Roto World. And check him out on Twitter at Samski NYC. That's going to wrap up today's podcast. Come up tomorrow, two star starters with Clay and Todd. Make sure to tune in for that. Thank you guys for joining us in the live stream. Thanks for listening to wherever you get your podcasts. Take care.